Hey guys, Jim here. One of the fun things about going to a knife show, particularly a large knife show, is the little discoveries that you get a chance to make. You know, you may not do it the first day or maybe even the second day that you're there, but when all the excitement is worn off and, you know, all your lottery possibilities are shot to shit, and you've gotten to the point where you just want to kind of wander the show and discover the little hidden gems. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to show you here tonight. Um, this is an amazing, amazing little knife that I discovered as I was just kind of cruising around at the Blade Show 2014. Uh, everything was kind of winding down, and I had pretty much done all the business I wanted to do and picked up all the knives I wanted to pick up. And I really wanted to see what little curios were out there. And as I strolled through the handmade section of the show, which was if you if you went in the front doors of the of the show and took a right, that whole corner section there toward the front was all handmade knives. And I had stopped to talk to somebody and I turned around and this knife caught my eye. And I was probably 10, 15 feet away from the table. And it drew me over to it. Um, the knife was obviously unsheathed and it was sitting out. And there were a whole bunch of others out there. There's actually a larger version of this particular knife as well. And I was in awe. I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, the Asian culture, as, uh, particularly as, as it relates to uh, knife making and sword making. And when I saw this sitting on the table, I had to come get a closer look. And I had to meet the gentleman that made it. Uh, I want to introduce you guys to a maker that you may not be familiar with. His name is Douglas Stice, S-T-I-C-E. And this is his Rokurai, the small variation of the Rokurai. He makes a larger one as well. And this is about eight and a quarter inches overall and just about three and three quarter inches on the exposed blade length. All Alabama Damascus, all done by hand everything done in his shop and the prices are unrealistically low because I sat there as I looked you know and he had the knives sitting there on little stands kinda of like this with their beautiful sheaths and just a little card in front of it with the prices and I was like oh this 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 can't be right especially in Damascus this can't be right so we kinda of struck up a conversation and I gotta tell you Doug was one of the most friendly guys that I had a chance to meet for the first time at the show. Uh, just loves knives, period. Flat out loves knives. And I told him, I said, listen, I'm at the point now, I've already dropped every penny and more uh, that I was going to drop during the show. And I introduced myself and uh, kind of told him what I did with the overviews and whatnot. I said, you know, if you ever have an interest in uh, allowing me the opportunity to uh, you know, put this under my lens, I would love to do it. And he simply put this in the sheath. He goes, uh, you like the one with the red or the blue? Or I'm like, I, I like the red stingray. He goes, here, take it. Didn't even ask me for anything. And I was like, well, here, let me at least give you my card so you, you know, have my phone number and address and things like that. He was so excited um, that somebody saw the beauty in his work. It was almost like everything else was a secondary thought. And that's the kind of guy that I really love getting involved with making me a knife. So I am actually placing my order with him uh, for one of these just ever so slightly different. It's going to be a slightly different blade. And we had a chance the other night to talk for well over an hour on the phone about his knives and the industry in general, and I was just blown away. And I want you guys to see what it is that I see in this particular knife that really does it for me. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is not a $600, $800, or $1,000 Damascus blade uh, Quiken style knife. This can be had for significantly less than $300. I forgot if this one was $200 or $250, so I don't want to quote an exact price, but it was unrealistically low. And one of the things that immediately caught my attention was the way he crowned the spine on the blade. And I love this particular feature because it adds more to that 
authenticity, the authentic feel of this knife. Incredible grind work. Uh, he does all of his grinds freehand, by the way. It doesn't uh, use a fixture or jig. Everything is done freehand. Wow, look at that. And the edge on this thing is really, really nice. I haven't done anything more than, you know, just minor paper slicing, you know, just to see how keen the edge was, and it was very impressive. So this is actually a rare pattern of Alabama Damascus. He said that basically it was custom ordered for a particular customer that never completed their order and made the knives with this particular steel. So they offered it up to Doug and I gotta tell you it's it's just gorgeous. He does all of the wrap himself. This is uh, obviously natural genuine stingray. This particular ray is done kind of in a uh, burgundy red and he uses the exact same uh, ray material and he has that inlaid into his leather sheaths, by the way. So you're getting the same exact, uh, you know, material that's being used from the knife over to your sheath. Just gorgeous. And there is the maker's mark for the sheath, by the way, which is kind of a big deal. You know, usually you really don't know if, if the maker's making the uh, sheaths or not. And he's actually partnered up with a gentleman named Bob Ferguson who owns Rawhide Custom Leather uh, that makes his sheaths for him. And I got to tell you, super high grade, super high quality. And it's one of those things, and it, it doesn't sound like something that should be an important thing. And it's really not. But when you open the big outer box that all this is sitting in, the smell of that fine leather just wafts out and fills the room with its aroma. And I, you know, it, it sounds funny, but it adds to the experience. You know, it, it's, it's like saying you're eating in a fine restaurant and there, there's an ambiance to the atmosphere that you're in that actually accentuates the meal that you're having. It sounds silly to actually say it, but it is true. And it's one of those uh, intangible things that uh, really helps to spark our interest in this. So let's take a nice good look at the overall quality. Uh, this is just a rub mark, by the way, from the sheath. What he's actually doing, there's like a little speed bump built in here. So when you put it into the sheath, it almost locks in like a kydex. So you've got a secure lock. It's not going to fall out. And you feel almost a detent uh, as it comes out of there. Give you a nice good close-up look in HD at the quality. What Basically what he says he likes to do is, is he likes that final third of a traditional samurai sword. That's the favorite uh, look that, that, that he goes for. And that's why he designs his knives uh, and emulates them so closely to a true uh, kind of a samurai style sword. Uh, very aggressive tanto on this. Nice thick blade stock. Reinforced tip. Very, I mean, this is a very stout little knife for such a small knife. Very stout. You're going to stab this thing through a car door. Well, I wouldn't suggest it because you're probably going to do this and slice up your hands. But uh, it just feels like it has that toughness toughness that's available to, uh, to do that at any time. Um, Doug is actually an avid hunter. And his whole point... Uh, when he makes his knives is, I want to be able to take this shit out with me. I want to be able to go out in the woods. I want a useful tool. I want it to look good. Obviously, there has to be an aesthetic beauty to it. But I want something that I myself would actually use. And that's what he puts into the knives that he's making. Because he wants you to not just have this sitting on a pretty bamboo display, maybe on your desk and using it as an executive letter opener. Um, and you certainly could but to actually have the ability to go out and use this for whatever the hell you want to use it for. It's got a great shape overall. You see it does have that, that traditional um, sway in the back of it. Now this is obviously going to be created uh, when the bar stock is cut. You need to keep that in mind. When you're looking at a traditional uh, samurai sword, this bow that you see from the butt to the tip is actually created during the quenching. You know, the, the, the steel is heated up to such a high degree and the, the folds in the, the steel is done in such a certain way that when they quench it, it creates this natural bow. Um, obviously, that is not going to happen on something that's anywhere near this, uh, this small. So, but he's getting that, that wonderful traditional look all the way around. 
And I asked him, I said, you know, why, why do you lean so heavily toward the Japanese influence? Obviously, he makes all styles of knives. He makes buoys, he makes daggers, he makes hunter's knives. But the majority of what I saw on his table uh, had this Japanese influence. And he says, for him, it's really about the aesthetic beauty that the Japanese bring forth in their designs. The very clean flow of design, the fact that it's a utilitarian blade style. Uh, that very, very pronounced uh, front edge on that Tanto, uh, very strong, tough tip. Everything about it is meant to stab, it's meant to gut, it's meant to tear shit up. So it has a wonderful usability. And he also loves the organic look when you've got the wrapped handles with the ray skin. And he wanted to create something that was a bit of art to, along with the usefulness. Uh, plus, his background is also he's a, he has a black belt in uh, Taekwondo as well. So, you know, that uh, that Eastern influence is certainly going to be running through his mind as he's designing stuff. Now, the other cool thing is he also does his own heat treat. Now, he has uh, little kiridashis and things like that that he keeps around 100 bucks or less, and he sends those out to Peter's Heat Treat. We, a lot of us know Peter's Heat Treat, a uh, very consistent, very high quality. Uh, but anything in this price level and up, he's doing his own heat treat. So literally, nothing is outsourced. It's one man uh, doing absolutely everything on these knives. And uh, he's looking at a 59 to 60 Rockwell hardness on this, which is pretty damn incredible when you think about it. So what you've got here is a super tough knife that's got an extraordinary cutting edge that's going to maintain that cutting edge for a good long time. And it's got the properties of a knife that you can actually beat on, that you can actually use. It doesn't matter if you're just going to be cutting down cardboard all day. It, it, it's something that it's not just pretty to look at. Uh, I did want to show you guys his card, by the way, so his contact information is there for you. There we go. Stice Handmade Knives. Douglas Stice is his name. And his website is right there. Uh, Sticecraft.com and you can reach him via email at Doug at Sticecraft.com and there's his phone number for you there as well. I gotta tell you, when I asked him how long of a lead time he has on these, and he says, well, I've got three or four builds going right now, so, I don't know, a couple weeks, I almost fell on the floor. Now, you got to realize there are a lot of guys at the blade show with handmade fixed blade knives. And there were a number of guys out there with uh, Japanese influence designs. They didn't look quite as, you know, traditional as this, but the influences were obviously there. Not only were those guys charging a lot more money, I saw quite a few knives in this style that were about double Doug's prices. But they've also got huge lead times. You know, maybe they've gotten a, a write-up in Blade Magazine. Maybe somebody reviewed their, uh, their knife on YouTube or talked about it on Instagram. I don't know. But uh, they had huge lead times. Or they were just slow because they're a part-time maker and they have a full-time job. And when he said, yeah, I, I could probably get one out to you in a couple of weeks, I, I almost fell over. I don't see how at the, the, the price range that he's at with the quality level that he's exhibiting here, how he's not booked year round. And I didn't really say it to him at the time when I was first getting the knife uh, to do the review, but I really wanted to get this out and put it ahead of a lot of the other videos that I want to get done. Because I want to see other people's reactions to his work. I want to see other people ordering knives from him and then getting them and going, holy shit, it's actually better than you are articulating in your video. He just joined Instagram. When I was talking to him yesterday, I said, you know, this is actually the place to go. If, 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 if you want to talk to people that love knives, the Instagram community is the way to be. So he finally signed up on Instagram for the first time yesterday. And uh, he's starting to get an idea of just how uh, insane and crazy all of us are. And then uh, a couple of Instagrammers that had commented on the pictures that I posted of this knife went, oh, yeah, I know Doug Stice. He makes an incredible knife. I've got one or a friend of mine's got one. And, and uh, yeah, the quality is impeccable. So I'm obviously not going to be the first person to tell you about him. But if you're just coming across this video and you're looking for really solid, beautiful works of art that are meant to be used, and you like that, that uh, typical, or excuse me, that traditional uh, Japanese styling, 
then you're going to want to check him out. You're going to want to check out his uh, website, take a look at the things that he's built. He's not done anything on Instagram yet, but I'm sure he will be doing some work in progress stuff soon. And get a feel for who he is and the style that he brings out. Because I got to tell you, the workmanship is amazing. You guys know me. I really don't do videos on fixed blade knives. I'm a folder guy. That's where I'm at. But when I see something like this, I recognize the, the beauty that's in it. And when I, saw, when I saw the little price card, I'm like, this has got to be a joke. It's crazy. Um, he says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to make what I need to make on these. And I don't see a need to really charge more. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. So, guys, you know, I love coming out here with knives that are made by big name makers. And everybody knows who they are. And, you know, I get to show off something really, really cool that either uh, another collector sent me for guest blade or I picked up at a show or something. But it, it is sad for me sometimes to go, yeah, this is great, but their books are closed forever or it's a five year wait. I enjoy more bringing out a maker that maybe you've never heard of before and their books are open and you can actually get something. You can actually, you know, stop the video and email them or call them and go, I just saw this really cool knife. You know, can I have something made like that? And they go, yes, and I'll have it done in about uh, two or three weeks or a month or two months. How awesome is that feeling? That's just the way I look at it. Let me give you some comparisons here because you guys know that I'm a big fan of, of the Quiken styles. You know, here it is up against my J. Kobach Kowayback and then my Pohan Lu Hamachi. This is not exactly a Quiken style knife, but it's, it's pretty damn close. And you see more of the influences uh, that are shared here, the way that that midsection kind of bows, your tip goes up and the butt goes up. Uh, Pohan goes a lot more straight on this. This is the style of knife that I enjoy the most. And the more I see it, the more I fall in love with it. I love Tantos. I love the, the piercing properties that that tip has. I love ones that, you, that do have a little bit of belly to the blade. Um, you know, when you look at this, I've got a little bit of an edge here that I can work with for, you know, more fine cutting stuff. But this is something that I'd love just to carry on me as a backup. It would never be my primary. I'm never going to carry a fixed blade for a primary. They're big. They're unwieldy. I'm not really going to pull it out in the post office uh, to, to cut a box down or something as I'm shipping something. It, I mean, it's a little bit scary if somebody just whips this out from underneath their shirt. Some people just can't handle shit like that. But this is definitely the kind of knife that I want to have in my collection. And I'm doing pretty much the exact same thing, thing here, except I'm going with like a 1095 or W2 with, with a hamon, you know, a lower hamon right up against the edge to really give more of that samurai uh, sword styling to it. But I got to tell you, and that, that's what I told Doug, but the more I play with this and the more I stare at it, I'm really in love with this Alabama Damascus too. I don't think it would kill me to own two. What do you think? Hmm. See, this is how that shit gets started, doesn't it? I just It's an addiction that you just continue to feed and feed and feed. Let's get a nice focus on this. That was half of what sold me right there. The incredible work. And again, all this is done freehand. So there you go, guys. There's a quick look, or not so quick look. I did end up talking longer than I expected. Uh, at the Douglas Dice... Rokurai, which actually means lightning bolt, by the way. Absolutely gorgeous. If you're looking for something in this vein, uh, definitely hit him up. But again, this is not the only style of knife that he makes. It was just the one that jumped out at me, the one that pulled me over to his table. And, you know, maybe when you get yours or you get a chance to see one at a show, you'll feel the exact same way that I do. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But all I can tell you is this, in a C of a thousand knife makers tables at Blade Show. There were only a handful that when I looked at their table, it drew me over and I felt compelled to meet the maker and touch the knives and, and fall in love with them. And this was one of those very few times. So I don't know if that means anything to you or not. I'm a little bit jaded these days as, as my collection has grown and the styles that I've gotten into are much more varied. 
And I saw this and went, I, I have to show this to people. I have to tell people about this. So hopefully that means something to you. All right, guys, I'm out of here after a full 20 minutes, and I will see you on the next video.